But what a day, it's Thursday, December 1st, 2022. And this is the week and charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and gals for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. All right, what are we talk about? Well, current market conditions, I'm gonna have a plethora <laughs> of stuff to say about that. Your favorite stock picks. Maybe crypto, I, I don't think there's gonna be crypto, but I do wanna take a look at Bitcoin at least and maybe Ethereum and a couple others. Obviously questions on trading. And right as I'm getting ready to go live, I was thinking a good title for tonight might be real world trading. Stuff you need to know when you actually trade. I did a show for Trading Simplified earlier this week. Actually it was published yesterday. And it's kinda, of, based on bridging the gap between the theory and the practice. We read all these books about trading and all this stuff sounds kind of gee whiz, but how do you actually implement it? And, and that's gonna be kind of my new ongoing quest to, to do some of those things. Bear market 2022, how are we faring? I wanna do a brief update there, especially when it comes to discretion. And got several questions that I wanna follow up on one or two questions, different strategies for different time frames. How do you know when the trend ends? Plus a few more, you guys were kind enough to ask some questions at Facebook today, and I appreciate that. It makes my job a lot easier, a lot easier, believe me. There's a flame screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as often summing up all predictions are about the future. Yeah, a lot of stuff can happen now and then. All right, so last week I did an update, or actually it was two weeks ago, I did a bear market update. So I'm gonna go through this really quickly. And as of two weeks ago, and the reason I didn't change this slide was just so that the numbers are more relative based on where we were a couple of weeks ago when I did the timestamps or the, the mark to markets. But the market was down 17% for the year. And I think a more important number, and I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. You can go much the older version if you want, if you want the longer version. But anyway, I think a more important number is the fact that we were down nearly 27% for the year not that long ago. So that means that anything you were holding on to got whacked likely a lot harder than, than 27%. And the if you're buying and holding, you, you should really have horrible performance based on those numbers, unless you got really, really, really lucky. So I think that's a more important number to pay attention to. So like I said last week, the results that I'm talking about come straight from a trading service, and they're based on mechanically following the recommendations. Discretion could, could help, and then I didn't realize there was a decent discretion one uh, last week. And I forget who pointed it out. It might have been John, you know, I thank him for that. And, or two weeks ago, when two weeks ago when I did this, I didn't see a whole lot of little discretions, and then somebody pointed out, SST, which really took off. And so I'll talk about that, but that's one of the reasons that I don't publish official results. One, it, it keeps me out of a lot of trouble because it's all for hypothetical purposes only. And then a little discretion makes a big deal. And also I don't like the service to be viewed just as a tip sheet. I like to, I like it to be seen as something a lot more than that something where you can get some ancillary ideas and a little color commentary in the market and so on and so forth. And maybe you actually learn a little bit about training in the process and get to see it unfold in real time. So this is what things look like last week. And this is the spreadsheet from the beginning of the year or actually on uh, December 31st. And one of the things that comes with the territory is it just flat out sucks, but I've heard many trend traders talk about it and Dennis specifically Richard Dennis he was okay with the turtles when they would have large open profit drawdowns he felt a little bit more differently with just flat out losses especially if they blew past the stop and they haven't gotten out but it happens spelled a silent sh coming into the year we had APG and we ended up losing 26.35 of that 67.45 you see there, plus the 960 on a swing trade. Now, ARLP actually worked out okay, and this is why we don't bail out when things get a little iffy. And I know some of you guys do, and that's fine. And trading all balls down as I preach to making decisions and living with them, if that's, if that's a decision that you made and you're willing to live with it, then 
that's fine. And like I said earlier today in, in, in Facebook, it's hard to to hold on to these stocks for these longer term trends, but that's where the real money is. And we were up 109% or 110% coming into the year on APG and we're and that obviously drew down quite a bit before we stopped out, but still a decent trade overall. And then I forget exactly where we were with ARLP, but I think it's um, 400% or something like that. And we were up 150 here. So that makes a huge difference. And this is on a hypothetical 100K portfolio. And I do try to mimic these trades best I can to show you actual fills and what I did and discretion and so forth. And I'll show you that too. Now, here are the positions mechanically on a closed basis. And then here are the dividends that we accumulated through ARLP this year, which is shocking. I never owned a stock in my life that had dividends like that. Maybe I get a penny or two here and there. So overall for the year, based on this, with no discretion, the portfolio was up 3.9%. I'm a little hesitant to show you these things, but I think during a bear market, it's important to show you what's going on. Now, as I said earlier, one of you guys pointed out the SST trade. So I grabbed it out of one of my accounts and we were only supposed to buy a thousand. So I'll normalize that to 500 in just one second. So that was my entry. And this is where I ended up getting out on the IPT. So what I did was I, instead of just taking the IPT, I let the stock run a little bit. And then those are those trades there. Now I did do a lot of option trading and I don't want to get into that too much, but if I could go in and do the, if I get a chance, I'll go in and do the forensics and try to explain to you what I was doing. If memory serves, I was doing something like, okay, let me, let me cash out of the stock and buy five options. And, and when a stock is up a whole bunch, okay, I mean, we got in at 16 and it was at 27. So that's like 10 points in a couple of days or one day actually. Then you you really can't look that gift horse in the mouth, but you also don't want to lose your position when it's doing so well. So in this particular case, I think if memory serves, I flipped out the 500 shares. I might have trailed the stop intraday, and at one point said, "Okay, that's enough." And I think I bought those options a little early, like before I flipped out the position to keep my 500 shares on. But anyway. We're not going to count the options. We're just going to assume that I flipped out the rest of them. And if you add all that up, that comes to 4403 per 500 sh shares. Okay. So it was 8,000 in profits here. And you'll notice for all the SST trading, and some of this might be a little SG over here. I have to look at it when I get a chance, but it was over 10 grand, but that's on 1,000 shares. And just looking at the shares themselves, again, it was 8806, real trades, real dollars. And then this is what the service did, 2563. So if we do the math on that, $4,400 on those 500 shares. And I'm not including the options again, even though it was another 1371. Let's just, I'm not going to bother with that, but you could probably add in another percent or so for that. But anyway, it comes to 1840. So if we go back to our spreadsheet, and we had that 1840 yen. Then you could see with just a little bit of discretion, that one or two days discretion, it could greatly improve performance. Now we're at about 5.7% with just that little bit of discretion. And again, I'm not gonna go pick it apart and go to try to find another K or two here and there by using a little discretion to, to make the numbers look a little better. I just wanna kind of show you that yes, you can improve the numbers quite a bit by applying a little bit of discretion. And discretion is no huge mystery. I teach it all the time. You get a big windfall like that overnight, you you ride it up intraday and try to squeeze out a few more points out of the position. So how are we faring? Like I said a couple of weeks ago, meh, you know, I'm far from happy, but you know what? The more I think about it, the happier I am that I'm able to put some positive numbers on the board, especially when I keep looking back and see that, and I see that the market was down over 27%. So I think anything positive in a bear market is is pretty impressive. You probably you probably beaten that. You probably if you're doing that as a private trader, which you have a lot more flexibility, obviously, than your 
probably be 98% or 95% at least of all money managers and 100% of all the buy and holds. Now, as I think I said earlier, I say often, open profit drawdowns suck when it comes to the territory. One thing I've been thinking a lot about lately is, is I, I've started working on this manifesto or training. <laughs> oh, probably several years ago. And a lot of that comes out in these presentations. That's part of my morning pages. Sometimes I'll go to do my three handwritten pages and end up doing 10. And it makes me late for everything because I get so absorbed and into it. And I've got probably 600 pages in my digital notebook. And then God knows how many other pages, probably another 500 scattered around my office that I've written. And one day I'm going to get around to slowly putting all this together. And one thing I thought about, not to go too far on a tangent, imagine that, but one thing I thought about is maybe doing a smaller condensed version of this and still do that masterpiece that I think it has the potential to be. I know it sounds a little presumptuous and uh, pompous and whatever else, egotistical, but I think there's something there, okay? And it's nothing that you guys haven't seen me say or do all along, but I'm just going to try to put it all together and, and every question I've been asked over the last 30 years, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, long story endless, one thing I was thinking about is, is how can I condense that down into I, to like a little book? Some of my favorite books, most favorite books, and it just so happened to have this one on my desk, one of my all-time favorite books is this G.C. Selden book. And if you go to daylander.com slash books dash two dash read, it's in the list. And uh, this was written, geez, I don't know, 1900s, 1918 maybe. But it's a great little book and I've read it countless times. And as I say often, I've bought a half a dozen copies because every time I can't find it, which <laughs> I can't find much in this office, I buy another copy. Anyway, my the viewpoints of commodity trade will be another one. It's, it's in that list on my website. You know, how do I condense it down into like a little book, maybe a little bit bigger than this, maybe a little bit bigger format, and give you the crux of, of what I'm thinking. Now, where I'm going with all this is trading all balls down to making decisions and living with them. And I think that if I could get the psychology right and help you to understand that, hey, a lot of this stuff is unnatural and you just have to live with it, okay? And in a, in a few minutes, for instance, we're going to talk about risk to reward or whatever, certainly just touch base on that. And the bottom line there is make better decisions like Papa John's. You know, you want better ingredients, better pizzas. I haven't eaten a Papa John's pizza in forever, so I have no idea if they're any good anymore. But you really want to pick the best stocks going in, and you really want to accept that. And another thing along those lines, I know I'm off on a on tangent, but... Along those lines, another thing along those lines is, I'm sorry, I'm trying to multiprocess, which you can't do. <laughs> but the more you learn about psychology, the more you learn how, how unnatural these things are, and the more you learn to accept them, and I know where I was going with that, the, the better off you're going to be. And, and one of the simplest things is I, I put a little trade gauge, and I published it in Facebook. And you just would manually decide where you are on trades. And I've been doing that more and more. And I think you can come up with like a big list of these things, like how's your home life and anything else that's extraneous to trading and so on and so forth. But the most important one would be one that said meh on the left and then F yeah on the right. And if your F, -er, if your F yeah trades are losing time and time again, then you're doing something wrong. But if you're making a lot of money for the most part on those, and you're losing money for the most part on the ones that are like over here somewhere, then you're starting to get it right. And then as I often say, the true, the true enlightenment comes when you take an F yeah trade and it stops out. And you might drop an F bomb, don't get me wrong, but you, you tell yourself, you know what? If I saw that same trade tomorrow, I would take it again. Anyway, all of that was started from open, open profit drawdowns, which suck. Outliers remain key. You got to catch that occasional five or six hundred percent move. This morning, I wrote a couple of pages on what to expect with the trading service, and maybe I should change it to 
what to expect with trend following because the, the trading service is just trend following, right? And, you know, just some of the things that I wrote were like expect to get stopped out a lot. This is going to be a whole presentation in and of itself. Expect to give up only to watch the next several setups take off without you. And I'm seeing a lot of that now. It's like I, a lot of clients recently quit because they were sick of me saying, hey, you know, sit on your hands, don't do anything. And they probably thought, why am I paying this guy, especially the newer guys? It's like my core group stuck with me through thick and thin. They've been with me, some some of you guys, 20 years. God bless you. <laughs> what do you have, What do you guys update your Facebook group and you grew about 40 years overnight? I'm like, good Lord. <laughs> so, but anyway, when I see a lot of people dropping off like that, it, it it makes me it it makes me feel good in the fact that it makes me feel bad that business is bad, but it makes me feel good in the fact that okay, I know we're getting we're getting to the end of this bear market because people are getting frustrated and they're giving up on trend following. And and, and the reason trend following works, believe it or not, is because sometimes it don't, and and maybe because a lot of times it don't. And that's something else to flesh out too. You want to see each position to fruition. Obviously, if I knew that one stock would, would lose me $2,600 a share, I would have gotten out, but you don't know that. We're trend followers, right? And I'm going to show you how we stick with trends because that was one of the questions that came up. He wants me to, uh, I'm sorry, this is what I, what I was trying to multi process with. I don't know if it comes up in the camera or not. Let me see if I can get that to work. It's a uh, psychology of the stock market, GC Selden. And again, go to my website books three and I put those links in post. But again, you want to see each position to the to its fruition because I didn't know that ARLP, ARLP has given us a few scares over the years and we'll take a look at that in one second. Years, is it almost two years? Triggered, I think, and we'll see when it triggered in just a minute. But the ARLP, even though it looked pretty ugly throughout a lot of the trend, not so ugly when you look at a weekly chart, but when you look at a daily chart, it's kind of all over the place. And but I had no idea it would go up another nine thousand dollars, and then I had no idea I'd get another fifteen hundred dollars in dividends. So you need to see each position to its fruition. As I said in Facebook earlier today, it implied that when I take a, a, a stock from the service, my job is kind of easy because. All I have to do is follow my own plan. So six months from now and, and hopefully six years from now and something like ARLP, I could pull up and say, see, I just followed along, just like I said, and I didn't get stopped out yet and I'm still in it. My own trading, eh, sometimes I'm not so good. <laughs> you know, I get, I get a little too caught up in all that psychology that I'm always preaching about being weary of. But for anything I recommend, I do exactly what, I say I'm going to do with the exception of applying a little discretion, which costs me a little money now and then. But for the most part, every now and then, I'm able to squeeze out some extra money like you saw earlier. Now, discretion wasn't huge, although that SST was pretty good. But there were a few things that helped over the years. All right, let's shift gears. Thank you, John. Uh, AOLP is starts uh was triggered on january 6 2021 so where i keep you know each each show each show it adds a year right it's like oh it's gonna be two years it'll be 10 years <laughs> so it's only one year we've been in this thing right one year as of um wait 126 122 oh yeah it's gonna be two years right if they would have had options up to 40 dollars, somebody could have really made money you talking about on the SST? Yeah, the options just weren't there. Oh, yeah, because I had to buy. Yeah, because I had to buy deep in the money options, which was okay. But yeah, I would have. I tell you what, I would have done. And you know, hypo, you know, what would the world be without hypothetical questions? But what I would have done was, when you're up so big like that, you don't know when, but you know you're going to get slammed. Okay. And you know you're going to give up a bunch of those open profits. And that's like on the second love, okay? So what I would have done was watch it like a hawk 
and I would have bought some wild ass crazy options. Maybe throw two thousand dollars at as many options as I can afford, but like a lottery bet, way out the money, okay? Or partially out the money, at least, you know, somewhat out the money, I should say. But I do seem to remember they didn't have any options at that point. And then I would watch that stock like a hawk. And then if I'm up 15 or 20 points or whatever the case may be, at some point I'll say, okay, that's enough. Pull the plug on that, okay? Because let's say I spent $2,000 on the options on, let's argue, a 100K account. So I know I'm going to lose at least $2,000 likely in a drawdown. And if this thing goes absolutely, pardon my French, ape shit, then all of a sudden those 50 options or however many I, I'm able to afford could be worth thousands, like $10,000 or, or something just absolutely ridiculous. So I kind of see where you're going. I'm a little hesitant to put that out there as an actual strategy. But I guarantee you, for you guys in Facebook, the next time, when, not if, because it will happen again, it's just going to take time. I don't know when. <laughs> like I always say, what's wrong? What's wrong, Dave? I'm in a drawdown. What are you going to come out of it? I, I don't know. <laughs> it's like I'm a trend follower, I'm waiting for a trend. Anyway, but yeah, that would have been that would have been fantastic. Okay, Jeff says, yeah, buying puts, 40 puts at 37 peak on day one would have been a big winner when you drop back down to 23. Oh, you talk about puts. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, that that makes it. My only problem with the puts, and I've done that before, and I, I got in a little bit of trouble with KOD. If you guys remember that. That's another one of those that just absolutely took off over nine on us. And the problem with the puts is you're 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 long the stock and then you're buying puts, and then before you know it, you end up with a lot of moving parts. And you're not sure whether you want the stock to go up or the or the stock to go down. And and so it gets a little it gets a little tricky when you start doing that. As a trend follower, I try to keep it simple and just trade in the direction of the trend and and you know maybe you could buy some puts a little further down just so you can keep your position but i wouldn't and i'm not sure i would buy in the money puts but i hear you you get your deltas to 100 and then you got then you got a bit of a, a mess on your hands and it, it just becomes too many moving parts but i hear you but yeah jeff let's noodle with it let's this would be a good problem to have Next time this happens, let's talk it out in real time and and see what we can come up with. But yeah, I'm 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 open to that. I just seem to get in a lot of trouble when I start playing puts and you know long puts and long stock. And I did a lot of that with GME, and I think in the end I probably got in a lot of trouble because I was printing money, but then before you know it, I'd be long puts and long calls and like do I want to go up, do I want to go down, the kind of Jackie Mason type of thing. Okay. Um, this morning I was seeing if you guys wanted to wanted me to cover anything in particular. And uh, Chris said you should just play the whipsaw song. I want to continue your reel and call it a day. I actually saw Sakota in person. We had a, a, a meeting over in Texas and we invited him over and he was kind enough to come. And he brought his banjo and he sung the whipsaw song to us, which was kind of cool. Anyway, brushed with greatness, I know. <laughs> so we'll take a look at that. He said, "Just let's just play the whipsaw song. No, 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 it's a good little song, and you can find him. You can find out on YouTube. So it's Ed Zakota on YouTube to give him credit on that. So, a couple of things I want. Another couple of questions here is that, which kind of dovetailed into what I wanted to talk about tonight. Anyway, in part, looks like we're in week 47 or so of the bear market. I think it's 48 according to the TFM." 10% system going all the way back to the, the high for the year. Santa Claus rally may put us over the buy line and we are already right at the 50 SM, SMA. He's got MA, but it's SMA. So what steps would you take to be ready and what precautions should you take to avoid experience of subs, uh, the subject of the whipsaw song? Well, there's nothing you could do to avoid being whipsawed, but when there are signs and signals of a market bottom and yes be prepared to get whipsawed if you're going to be a swing trader i'm sorry a, a trader trend trader is what i'm trying to say anyway i, I go to the lyrics 
If you get a whip and I get a saw, one good trend pays for them all. That's why I'm beating a dead horse on the ARLP. Honey Trader, <laughs> baby mine. Roger Winters, what do we do when we catch a trend, honey? We ride that trend to the end. And to the end always is a question. And I'll talk about that in one second. That's one of the questions that came in today. Cut your losses. What do we do when we show a loss, honey? We give that dang gone loss a toss. Now, you gotta be careful. You can't bail on everything because you have a loss. And this might not be the best example, but I don't know if nine went negative. It might have. We just triggered it in two new positions, nine, N-I-N-E, and C-E-N-X. I know C-E-N-X triggered immediately went negative, and I know one of you guys was like, oh, crap, you know, I'm down 3% first day. It happens, and you have to learn to accept and embrace that. And I'm so much better at accepting and embracing the stuff that I put out publicly because it's almost like I'm forced to do what I say. So if you really want to get brave, and I, I told one of my clients to do this once, as I've said before, and he said, oh, no, that went into marriage. And I said, you know, tell your wife, well, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm following. I like this guy. He's he's not the grand fool Bob, but he's a trend following moron. And we're going to make money. We're going to lose money. Every now and then we're going to catch a big trend. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm going to follow. And, and just expect some losses because it's going to happen. Expect to be in a drawdown. And as a trend follower, you spend a lot of your time less wealthy, a lot of your time, I'd say the majority of your time, believe it or not, while you're waiting for that big, huge trend to come along. And also another thing I was thinking about this morning is you can't need money if you're a trend follower because one, you're going to be losing money a lot of the times or at least less wealthy, okay? And then two, you can't cash out of ARLP. You couldn't have cashed out of ARLP last Christmas, I'll get my, I've got my dates all messed up, but let's just say you needed money earlier this year, then you would have lost 9,000 plus another $1,500 in dividends, 9,000 capital gains, $1,500 in dividends. You know, so that's an extra 10, 11 grand that you would have to give up on. All right, what else? How do we know when our risk is right, honey? We make a lot of money and we sleep at night. One of the things that kind of shocks me is if you if you pick your spots carefully, I'm gonna show you a trade here on a cheaper ETF, there's only a thousand shares. Now I did it across multiple accounts, but an even better example would be some of these ETFs I bought late in the day on Wednesday. I'd only I was only putting on a hundred shares here and there, and they were paying off nicely. So when markets are really in a route having that wide range bar day, you could put on tiny positions, like a hundred shares and pick up a point or two. And if you do that several times before you know it, you've picked up a grand or two on, on those trades. So that's keeping your risk in line. And you want that to be minuscule on a day trade. And I don't want to encourage day trading too much, but I am here all day and I do occasionally see some opportunities. I'll explain that in just one second. But for your trend trades, 2% seems like a, it's actually quite a sizable number if you think about it, but 2% is a pretty big number. So in a 100K account, you're risking $2,000 per trade. If you have a much bigger account, you might wanna bring that percentage down a little bit. But 2% is plenty, it's a, it's a, it seems to be the sweet spot. It's just enough to really make a lot of money if you're right, okay? And it's not so much that you lose your ass when you're wrong. You stops. What do we do when the price breaks through? Honey, our stops are in, so there's nothing to do. So every now and then you have to put in a hard stop. I, truth be told, something got away from me the other day. And I was kind of deer in the headlights. And I said, Dave, put in a stop. Put in a stop, put in a stop. So I put in a stop. And I was fortunate it, it didn't hit the stop. And then it turned around. But that's bad behavior. And I got rewarded for bad behavior, but I recognize that was bad behavior. But the point is, if you're in a position that's going against you and you need to be out, number one, either exit at the market or number two, just put in a hard stop a little bit further away and then walk away. 
what do we do when a drawdown comes, honey? What do we do when it gets real big, babe? What do we do when it's even bigger? We stick to the plan and pull the trigger. So I'm not exactly sure what he's saying there, other than I think that you're to draw down and the next opportunity comes along. And believe me, it, it it's tough. You know, like the intraday stuff, I, I hit a drawdown on that and it's hard for me to take another trade. And then sometimes I'll go on a really, really tiny size just to kind of ease back in. But with the trend stuff, I have to go in with a full 2% position because I'm following the system. So I, I kind of get, now that I talk it out, I kind of get where he's coming from there. Ignore news. I ignore all news. What do we do with a hot news flash? Honey, we stash that flash right in the trash. Okay. All right. Lots of questions and thoughts coming in. Thank you, guys. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. The options were not as good as they could have been because they did not have options as high. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. That's the problem. It, it was something like that. Now, if it was a, um, if the stock had been at that level before, then they probably would have have options there. But it, yeah, I hear you. Now, one thing I was thinking about because the TFM system is starting to catch up to the market, and I'll walk you through that in one second. Now. You can't time off time, and I know some people have tried. And whenever I see these esoteric and arcane things, I think to myself, well, they're they're not actual traders. You can't say, I'm gonna use some kind of time prediction and it's gonna stop on this date or whatever. I mean, you can if you predict early and often. <laughs> and then you go, yeah, you see, I got it right. <laughs> it's like, uh, Kind of reminds me like of the Bitcoin naysayers, you know, Bitcoin 900, that's ah, BS, you know, 1,000 is BS, 2,000 is BS. You know, it's BS all the way up to 60,000. And then now it's down, uh, what is it now? 20,000 or so, we'll take a look at it. You know, they're like, you see, I told you I was right on that crypto. I'm like, well, it went from it went from 25 cents to $60,000. It's like, you could have made money on that. And, and you have to be, what's the word, agnostic or ambivalent or you just, you just have to not care. It kind of reminds me of what Larry Williams says. You just, in order to be a good trader, you just have to not care. You have to, you have to be clinically dispassionate, and you can't confuse the issue with facts. Yeah, Bitcoin's probably total bullshit. Who cares? Okay, the so shit coins certainly are, but I made a lot of money in shit coins. Lost a lot of money too, but <laughs> that's a different story. But if you follow the trend, you should be okay. Anyway, lower in the bear markets, the closer you are to yeah, end. That's kind of a stupid thing to say, but. It'll make a little sense in a minute. And if you go and study bear markets historically, you'll see how eventually they do bottom out and we get back to a bull market. 27% as far as price is concerned, it's more than enough to qualify as a bear market. So that's deep enough to be, to shake out a lot of people and to wake up a lot of people. And maybe if the market starts going back up, the people who feel like they need to buy low might start rushing in. So there's a lot of psychology of a market going down that far. It doesn't mean that it can't keep going down. What was the NASDAQ was down 50% and then it dropped another 50%, I think, in 2000. That was a pretty amazing thing to see. Now, the more it drops, the lower the buy signals will be to get you back in. And that's what somebody was alluding to. And I'll, I'll walk you through that in just a second. Now, one thing I found kind of interesting, and I did a little research here this morning, and it's always dangerous when you're doing something like, oh, well, it's been trending so long, it's due to end. And I didn't really find anything definitive, but I was looking at what happens when you're down 150 days below, highs below the 50-day, I'm sorry, the 200-day moving average. So. Here's the Landry light, which counts the number of bars. So as of yesterday, we were 153 bars, if memory serves, of downside Landry light. This little kiss didn't quite touch it. Although if my moving average is a little skinnier, you could see a little daylight in there, or as we now call it, Landry light. Anyway, so after work has been going down for a long time, maybe it's time for it to bottom out now you can't just time directly off of this 
but I think it's a, a piece that sort of helps you. And I, I couldn't figure out a way to make it test out today when I was doing the hand testing on this. But if it's been under the 200 for a long, 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 long time, and then you see a nice big reversal bar like this at brand new multi-year lows, and then the market starts working its way higher, and then all those harbingers of a bottom thing, none of which you can time off of. It's just little bitty pieces you put together that make me think that we're we're getting close to a bottom at least. And the bottom line is you watch your database, and when your database starts giving you buy signals, you take them. So we took nine again, and we took CENX. Those are the two most recent ones. We took SGML recently and failed miserable, as you know. So it's 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 not all. <laughs> sunshine and uh, rainbows. Okay, so this is what we're talking about here with the TFM catching up. So if I counted my bars right, it's been 48 weeks as of tomorrow's close since we had this new closing high up here. So the system looks back 50 bars, okay? And you can see the number right here, percent of close, 50 bars, and we're going to do 90%. So this is the 10% below that 50 bars. Now, you can see the moving average is headed lower because what's happening is you're adding in lower prices and dropping off higher prices. So that average is moving down. That's the drop-off effect, right? So the point that somebody was making earlier in the question or statement was that the buy line is going to start coming down. So we're two weeks away from the buy line to start dropping. So it's going to start to kind of zigzag down. So three weeks from now, it's going to use this close. So it's going to drop by that amount, then this close. And then I think it'll be, it might be this close will be the next one, the next lowest one. So that buy line, that 10% line is going to start to drop. And the buy signals are two lows above the 50 simple moving average and also a close above the buy line or a close within 10% of the 50 week closing high. This was actually a buy signal here. I didn't notice it because my moving average lines were so thick. And somebody was complaining because I didn't talk about it and they took it. And it's like, well, it happens. Okay, it's a whipsaw. But if you look at what happens when you exit from here down to here, that's a pretty serious drop, especially if you go all the way there. So so that would have, yeah, you lost about 4% on that signal, but it stopped you from losing another 20% or so. Plus, maybe the next signal will take off. Look at how long this thing stayed long, okay? So that was a huge run in there. and. I will show the, I'll put the spreadsheet up next week. I try to only put one spreadsheet a week. <laughs> the number of views goes <laughs> goes down exponentially or geometrically on, based on the number of spreadsheets. But anyway, so this is a start to catch up with price. Now, somebody was saying, uh, one of the famous traders out there talked about uh, make your reward to risk five to one. Now, I don't know the system, so I don't know what he's doing. I don't want to pick that apart. But the point I was trying to make is that that's kind of a general statement. Obviously, you want your winners to be bigger than your losers, right? But my point is that when you, if you're risking 1x and taking profit at 5x, you're five times more likely to get stopped out. So if the math is right, there's an 80% chance you're going to lose money just based on the statistics alone. Now, maybe your stock picking, as I alluded to earlier, can improve upon that. But it just seems like the odds are really stacked against you. I believe in potentially unlimited gains, and I think you're going to need those unlimited gains occasionally, especially when you go through a bear market like we're going through now, to keep you afloat and actually maybe help you make a little money. So Chris says, all true, but another question that is never really answered in detail is when is the trend over? I think I do a pretty good job of answering that. But we'll, we'll talk about that. This is very subjective, and it is. The longer your time frame is, though, the deeper that end of the trend 
will be. And I'll flesh that out in just one second. Is it moving average? It can be. Days, weeks without making it a new, without making it a lower high, air support resistance. Yeah, it's all of these things, okay? I think a true caveat in trend following, I've listened to read many trend traders folks, and no one really defines what quantifies their trend. Well, I have trend qualifiers, okay? Landry light, gaps and laps of direction of the trend, wide range bars, strong closes, persistency, acceleration. All those things define trend, and then patterns such as first kiss after daylight, bow ties, first thrust, those are all early trend or emerging trend patterns. So I do have those patterns there. And then uh, TKOs and persistent pullbacks and Landry Light pullbacks, those are all established trend patterns. So I feel like I have patterns that cover the trend. And then we look at the volatility of the market, which I'll flesh out here in just one second place I'll stop accordingly and then we let that open up to the longer term volatility. So I think I have I think I have a system here that helps for when the trend is over. Yes, SWJ says the weight of evidence. So yeah, the weight of evidence. Um one thing that I'm working on in my little um you know my little GC Selden type of book is is a little bit of uh, you know I've written a lot a lot on this apologetics for technical analysis technical analysis apologetics and i'm not defending all the technical analysis there's a lot of bullshit out there right all these arcane things and and you know rule of square nines and stupid stuff okay it doesn't work it, I, I guarantee it doesn't work and i'd be willing to bet that I, i'm not gonna bet my hard earned cash because sure to say that somebody's gonna show me it works and then I'll give up my money and then I'll stop work. <laughs> but I do know some very, very, very smart people through millions of dollars at, I believe it was Elliott Wave, and people way smarter than I'll ever be. And they decided, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> they were like Osman. They're like, yeah, nah. Okay, we'll come back to this question here. Um, let me go ahead and, and bang it out real quick because I've got a couple of charts I want to get to. So recently you raised stops and some service, some picks of the service, C and X and nine probably. I thought all the trade courses you only discussed managing stops after the IPT is hit. Now that's a little confusing because when the IPT is hit, initial profit target, let's say you're looking for four points on a trade. If that stock goes up and hits that IPT, even if it's on day one, that would be great, right? If it hits an IPT, <laughs> what has two thumbs, speaks fluent French, and loves it when his stocks hit the IPT? Mwah. So anyway, that's not the actual joke, but <laughs> I don't want to get kicked off of YouTube. <laughs> anyway, when it hits the IPT, you immediately bring that stock up to break even. So that's one of the rules, okay? But but when if the stock's just kind of like doing a little uh, little prices right, man, you know, doo -doo 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 -doo, going up. You kind of trail that stop on a one-for-one -one basis, although in more recent years, I've been a little bit more lax and, and not going quite one-to-one -one with that and let that stop open up a little bit. Now, I'll, this will make a lot more sense over time, I mean, in a few minutes, I should say. And then the other thing is, it, when, if something makes a small move, you play, keep the change. Something goes up a few cents, don't worry about it, okay? Don't move your stop, no matter where your stop is. Where you know, the, in other words, no matter where you are vis-a-vis -vis the initial profit target. Now, if something makes like a three-point move, maybe you just bump your stop up two points as you're letting that stop wide now for that longer-term trade. And that's going to make more sense when I pull the chart. So this is straight from trading full circle. And I think a lot of this is in the members area which you'll get right away is being a member. And if you stay a member long enough, you get the course for free, just FYI. But a lot of this is in the members area in the money management. But you need to ask yourself how long you want to stay in a stock. If you want to stay in a stock a couple of years, like I do, you're going to have to have a super, super, super wide stop. Well, the problem is it's too far away. So I 
switch hats from being a swing trader to a longer term trend follower. You're only going to be right. I was shocked when I did a ton of mechanical testing. I think I had like 2,000 systems or something I wrote back in the day. Now, some of them are just, you know, different moving averages or whatever would count as a different system, but pretty much same stuff. And by the way, they all look alike after a while. So it's, that's not impressive that I wrote 2,000 systems. I actually gave them to Emilio Tomasini. I don't think he found anything in them. So it's like not bragging. But anyway, one thing that I did learn from that process is you're only going to be right as a longer term trend follower about 28% of the time. In fact, if you're right that much, that might even be an exaggeration. If you're if you're right that much, you, you would likely print money. So the odds are about 70 to 72 percent, maybe 80 percent against you, if you're trying to capture a longer term trend. But your odds get a lot better if you're trying to capture a swing trade. I don't know how much better. It depends on your stock picking. But let's just say if you have decent stock picking. You can at least get that down to maybe 50 50. I know it sounds stupid. Like, you know, well, yeah, you just say in a coin toss. So, you know, what good is that? Well, that's trading. Okay. And that's life. But anyway, my goal is to let that stop loosen over time to shift gears into being a trend follower. Now, when you're a trend follower over here, drawdowns to open profits suck, as I've said ad nauseum tonight. So, depending on your holding time, you want to let those profits slowly open up. So on your first low, you treat it more like a swing trade, and then you let it gradually open up, often by not doing anything. Now, the second question you need to ask yourself is how volatile is the stock? And as I've said a thousand times, probably 2,000 times, or 2,600 times, there used to be a popular method, and I don't want to say the name of the method because it's kind of where I got my start, and it, it did give me a technical analysis, but there used to be a popular method, I guess it still is, that recommends an 8% stop on every stock you trade. Well, that's like saying we should all wear a medium-sized shirt, something my fat ass hasn't done since five years old. Who am I kidding? Four years old, okay? So you have to adjust this stop for the volatility of the stock. I know some people, and I don't want to rub salt in anyone's wounds, but I know some people, some clients that didn't take the ARLP trade, they told me after the fact, because they couldn't take a stock with a 20% stop. It was a $1 stop on a $5 stock. I'll show you that in one second. But that's what it called for. If a stock bounces around four points a day, and you put your stop within those four points, you're going to get stopped out on noise alone. So you have to ask yourself how volatile the stock is. And then the next question is, which was being asked earlier is, where would you be wrong as a trend follower? How do you know the trend has ended? Well, the question is you don't, but just going after these, just going through these really quick, let's say you get long a stock and you're playing a pullback, first pullback after base breakout. If it comes back into the base, you're wrong. Anybody remember when you used to do that? <laughs> These slides are a little dated. Now, if you're trading something like a first thrust, which is the bottoming type of emerging trend pattern, and it goes all the way to near its old lows, then you are what? You're wrong. So the pattern sometimes, especially with emerging trend patterns, let's say like the, the S&P 500 had a first kiss after daylight, a first thrust, a bow tie, and all kind of transitional patterns. The same thing happened to the pandemic, okay? All these patterns set up, and if you took the short and the market went on to make new highs, you're wrong, okay? So with emerging trends, it's pretty damn easy. And by the way, you're going to be more wrong on the emerging trends than you will with the established trends, but the chance of capturing a long-term trend, chance of getting in a longer term trend earlier, early is great. So here's a bow tie, you can see, let's say you trigger in, the stock drops to near or makes new lows, then you're wrong. So here's a, an example in USO, you can see it's a little bit dated, but made a first thrust off of lows, made a little pullback, 
if it goes down and makes new lows, then that longer term trend is still in place. Right now in stocks, the longer term trend is still in place. The short term and immediate term trend is up. I'm excited about that, but I know I'm fighting a longer term trend. So if you take this trade in oil, you're fighting a longer term trend, but the short term trend is turning. So hopefully that's kind of answering the question about the end of the trend. Now, the hardest thing, hardest pattern set a stop, unless you got a TKO, we got a textbook setup, like the nine was, N-I-N-E, you're not really sure where to put that stop. Like how did you get in and is the stock not through correcting or is it a bona fide reversal? So there becomes a question mark. If you're trading a deeper pullback, then you could get a little tighter sometimes with your stop because that reversion, that well, that that stretch from the mean, that rubber band is already stretched to the downside. Where's my props? Here we go. So the rubber band is always stretched, already stretched to the downside. Wrong. <laughs> okay, so I put it a weekly chart because the daily chart just wouldn't have made a lot of sense. But the zigs and zags, believe me, on the daily chart are much bigger. And writing this trend out is not nearly as easy as it looks. But this is where we started back here as a swing trade. And this is where we are now. So you can see on a point basis that stop has widened out, okay? And it came dangerously close to stopping us out, but didn't quite hit it. I double checked it to make sure I didn't mess up, but it came really close to stopping us out. But getting back to time frames, looking at a weekly chart, okay? This just looks like a pullback and a bit of a consolidation now, okay? So this trend still looks pretty good longer term. And it sure would be nice to make new highs. That I would breathe a sigh of relief if we did. But by the way, look, here's 2022. Here's where we started, 12 and change, okay? We hit 27 not that long ago. We had a serious drawdown to open profits. Sucks, okay? George is saying long above 25. Eh. Yeah, everybody should get long above 25. You got you got grandkids, college funds? Put your, put your grandkids in this. No, 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 I, I wouldn't, you know, George, if you're trading weekly setups, then maybe look at something like this and trade weekly setups. But I, I know you, you trade way too much. You trade way more than you should, but you're getting better at it, I know. But no, uh, I wouldn't say long about 25, but I hear you, you know. If you were trading this weekly pullback, you probably should have been long above this bar somewhere, maybe about 24 or so. And then, you know, maybe you could trade weekly pullbacks and put a stop in below the low. You know, enter at 24, stop at 20. I don't know. I don't trade weekly charts. And it, as I was putting the show together, I was thinking, boy, it sure does look damn easy, right? Maybe when, maybe my next life, if I ever get away from all these screens <laughs> for a little while and go out and enjoy my life a little, I, I have too much fun here. I guess that's why. You know, every day I got to remind myself I enjoy doing this, you know, because we had a cocktail party, I'd be like, oh, just standing there, you know. And my wife's like, well, what's he doing? He's a trader. He loves it. I was like, oh, oh yeah, I do love it, you know. <laughs> but sometimes it's hard. But anyway, like a little pullback, like look how obvious this is. So in my next life, I'm just going to look for weekly trends that look like this and then pullbacks. And maybe, I don't know if they make them anymore. Maybe I'll get a copy of um, Daily Graphs overnighted to me. I doubt they make them anymore. Anybody remember those? I used to such a nerd i couldn't wait to get my copy of daily graphs and it just flipped through the charts those were fantastic i know you know dick fruth i think still gets them or was getting them years ago anyway the stop went from one point to 550 and as i said earlier somebody didn't trade it and hopefully it's not too many people i know it's more than one but they didn't trade it because they couldn't trade with a 20 percent stop now keep in mind we're we're bringing our share size way down. We only bought 2,000 shares of this, okay? And it was less than five bucks a share. So just round numbers, we put, what's that, $10,000 margin up for this trade, which, you know, you're buying, let's say you're buying 400 shares of a $50 stock. What would that be? Like $20,000 margin, right? So it was only 10,000, which isn't a huge, which is a, it's substantial, don't get me wrong, but it, that isn't a huge amount of money to put down for margin, not for your stop. The stop was $2,000 and then your margin was only 10. 
So I'm totally okay with putting the stop where it should be and just bringing my share size down. People just have a hard time with big numbers when it comes to percentages. Like, oh, I can't be that wrong. Well, that's what it calls for, okay? 20% this stock is, is back here is a blip. You know, here's here's five and here's four. Okay, so here's a 20% move. Look at this, here to there. Look, look at that move, it's huge. Little tiny Elvis coming out, right? That's a 20% move. That's a 20% move or maybe a 18% move, but you get the idea. Now, the question like I asked a few weeks ago and I've been slowly kind of answering it on and off for a few weeks is, do you have different strategies for different time frames? Well, I'm kind of hesitant to show you this day trading stuff because I don't want to make it look easier than it is. It's hard. Um, I don't stress out a lot about my core methodology. I've grown, grown to accept it and embrace it. But if I start watching the screen all day, you know, as I've been saying for a few weeks, my uh, my arm's going numb from a pinched nerve or something from tensing up watching screens too much, okay? Watching the intraday zigs and zags. In fact, I've actually, I actually keep up in my charts from a five minute chart to a 15 minute chart. And now I'm at a 30 minute chart, <laughs> you know? So I'm not watching the zigs and zags too much. But there are a few things that I do pay attention to. And if we take a look at the SOX L and yesterday, LabVIEW worked out okay. Uh, ARC and, uh, Fang Yu and I think Vito actually worked out okay too. Well, Vito wasn't that impressive, but there were quite a few of these long ETFs that did well. So for an intraday chart, a lot of times you can't sit around and wait for all the the the, the trend volume moron stuff like the bow ties and all these other patterns that I trade. You trade it more like a like a breakout trader will, but hopefully you wait for breakouts and you make sure the trend, it, you make sure it looks like a really, really solid breakout because breakouts often fail, as you probably know. So in this case, there are the trades, I'll walk you through it. And I did this across multiple accounts. So I'm not betting the form on this stuff. I think my stop was 40 cents. But even still, that's $400 at risk. I mean, you lose $400 a day, that's 100 grand a year. Don't forget that, right? So anyway, in this case, it sold off in the morning, and I tried not to get too caught up in it. And on a 30-minute chart, it doesn't look as as big as it does on this chart. And it just chopped around, chopped around, chopped around. So I knew my fake out was to the downside, and the play would be if it took out the high of the day. And I was a little gun shy on buying the breakout, and I'm surprised when I was putting my charts together tonight how late I got in. But I think my reasoning then was not to risk 40 cents, but maybe risk the low of the breakout bar. So if it came right back in, but the market was kind of going straight up at the time. So I played it as a breakout. So the moral of the story is what do I do differently? I'm more willing to play a breakout intraday than I would, I would never say never, but in general, I don't play, play breakouts unless you count, Unless you count something like buy at V and IPOs as a breakout. That's the closest thing to a breakout pattern that it actually trade on daily chart. You're gonna fail miserably trading breakouts, but every now and then you'll catch one. I know some traders that do trade breakouts on daily charts and they're wrong 90% of the time, but every now and then they catch that nice big trend. It used to be a lot easier to trade breakouts. That's what the turtles did. Okay, they bought 28 highs, right? And uh Don Chan type of stuff. But you can't do that anymore because <laughs> everybody's got a computer on a desk. Anyway, once it got moving, I figured 40 cents would be a good IPT and a good trailing stop. So I unloaded half there and then I sold the rest market on close. And so that netted me 776 for the day, better than the polka eye. That didn't come along every day though. And if I could just wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait, and all of a sudden we got a route day. We got a route day, okay, the hook's in, the hook is in, and pile on, jump in and pile on. In fact, and I hate to, I'm hesitant to say this, but in a, on a day like this, I'll buy and flip out, and then if I'll see I'll see other things that are going up. I'll get in, let's say late in the day, in a little bit of a breakout, putting a super tight stop, 
And I'll keep doing that as long as it's working. And I'm talking nickels and dimes, right? 100 here, 100 there, 200 here, 200 there. And pick it up, $75, $100, you know, and, and just a little bit here and there, just keep buying and buying and buying and then flipping them out, flipping them out, flipping them out as they move in my favor. And trying to ride like on the small positions, like 100 shares or whatever, try to ride those to a market on close. So to answer your question, on the intraday stuff, it's a little bit more breakout, has a little bit more breakout characteristic. Now, ideally, I want to do something like uh, open a gap reversal, which is basically the core methodology, a pullback, and then a gap lower to look to play a gap back up. And if you go in and watch some of the archives on the week of charts, you'll see a few of those. So there's the trade again if you want to screen capture. I guess I'll need to start giving out these slides if anybody wants them. Let me know if this is something you want. Uh, drop a comment below if you're on YouTube. And uh, I'll, uh, I could put these in a, in a campaign to where you could just put your email in and it'll automatically be emailed to you if that's something interesting. All right, let's shift gears. Let me get to the markets. Let's take a quick look at crypto first. Let me uh, take a look at some of these. Had already cashed out of first half. Oh, I guess that's SST. Okay, we'll take a look at that. We'll take a look at dollar. The magic of ARLP is the dividend. This is an unappreciated discipline. Yeah, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, you want to get rich longer term, you know, buy dividend stocks. I'm like, no, no, because sometimes those dividend stocks will go down 50%, you know? And uh, I don't want to be too mean, <laughs> but I knew somebody once that was all excited because they were buying a stock that had an 18% dividend. The stock was literally going straight down. And they're not going to be able to pay that dividend for much longer. And you're going to lose about 100% of your money in the process. All right, let's just shift gears real quick to crypto. And then we'll get to the, you start asking about any stocks or markets or anything else you want to look at. And then let me know if there's anything crypto you want to do. Let me see if I can get my screen working here. Okay, here's crypto. Crypto market's still not so hot, as you probably know. Let's just take a look at some of the biggies. And if there's anything you want to look at, let me know. There's Bitcoin. Now, I did read something interesting recently, and I'm not sure how you would apply it to Bitcoin. Because I really thought this was going to be the bottom. It just seemed like every time we got down here around 18,000, it would kind of bottom out just for shits and giggles let's take a look at uh let's do it can you do a, a one month chart let's take a look at the quarterly chart yeah so they only pick looks like this this only goes back to 2800 i remember buying bitcoin at eight nine hundred you know uh bitcoin is bullshit well you know i went from 25 cents to 60 four thousand dollars so you were you're right you're right it's total bullshit you know look at it it's seventeen thousand dollars you win you know you win <laughs> so, i'm not saying it's i'm not saying it's not bullshit but you know what if you don't care what you trade you can make a lot of money write that down <laughs> i'm full of it tonight huh Little uh, 230 EMA, I don't think I'd take that, but little for those keeping score. And Elon, what's my little buddy, my old buddy Shiva doing? You know, all these things below 30 EMA, leave them alone, okay? Just leave them alone. And that'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. Let's see if we can do a real strange sort. The, there's a few that have taken off in here, but most of these don't have much structure. And, you know, I'm guilty of not doing as I say. I probably, I, you know, I just kind of give these things a casual look once a day. I probably just spend a little bit more time looking at these shit coins and see if there's anything worthwhile. S H Y T, by the way, is the official spelling on that. So I'm not being completely rude here. Anyway, I don't see anything to do in crypto, at least not at a quick look. Okay. Uh, all right. Let me shift gears. Let's get the stocks. And I'm just going to blow through this quickly because we're kind of running a little late. I know I'm my fault. All this filibustering. Let's share. Let's see if we can share the TC. Okay. Um, let's 
take a look at the P's. Okay, this is what I was saying ad nauseum, right? Longer term downtrend. I'm not a huge fan of trend lines, but connect the highs, it's kind of cool, right? You know, we're right at we're right at the bumping up against the long term trend line. Lo and behold, look at the 200 day moving averages right at that peak, and then 200 day is right right around that, close enough for government work. You're going to find a lot of technicals come together at the same spot, which is kind of a cool thing. I know you want to party with me. So what's the trend? Well, shorter term, it's up, right? Okay, let's take a look at the bow ties. Okay, so kind of sloppy in here, but uptrend proper water, okay? You know, the question is, well, how do you know trend? Well, downtrend proper water, downtrend, okay? Uptrend proper order, uptrend. That's a good start, right? And so far, now it's all over the place, but so far we're working our way higher in here. And let me just go back to the P's just for a second. Let's take a look at the weekly, okay? So you can see weekly proper order hasn't changed yet, but it's it's gonna happen fairly soon. So weekly proper order downtrend, weekly proper order uptrend. Look at this, look at this bow tie back here, okay? And what did the market do? The market ran, let's see, uptrend, up, proper order, downtrend, proper order, about 50%, okay? So that's better than the poke in the eye. And as I've said, I know, I mean, some of you guys said, please stop saying it. <laughs> you know, downtrend, proper, look, bear market, bull market, bull market, bear market, bull market, bear market, although this one, would have wouldn't have gotten you out in time. But we had a TFM 10% system sell then. We had a daily bow tie sell then too. So that got us out of kept us out of a lot of trouble. All right, there's the NASDAQ. Let's get back to the daily chart. As you can see, work its way higher. I think unless we come all the way back in, then all bets are off. But as one of you guys said earlier, weight of evidence, okay. So weight of evidence, add this into your, your plus column. You got this huge wide range bar up. You closed on the high. This means everybody in the brother had to buy or a hell of a lot of shorts were getting squeezed, okay? But this kind of buying, this kind of panic buying, people that think they missed the bottom, shorts getting squeezed, who knows? That tells me that a lot of people want in this market. Now that's just one day, so let's see what happens. If we come back in, that's gonna to totally negate that one good day. But let's hope, a word you should never use, but let's hope we don't come back in. Somebody's talking about the dollar. There's a the Euro, Euro's doing pretty good, right? Damn it, I should've gone to Europe. Should've gone to Europe, we're down here at 96 cents, all right? Damn it, too late now. This is the pound, the pound looks like it's doing pretty good. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Rusty still has a big fat bottom in place, big fat double bottom. And bow tie, uptrend, proper order. So far, so good. As I would say, a nausea, I'd actually prefer kind of a gradual, somewhat choppy, not too choppy, but somewhat choppy uptrend as opposed to a market that goes straight up. Because a market goes straight up, like right now, there's no setups, okay? Virtually no setups. We've got one for tomorrow. And then we could probably have none if this market doesn't pull back soon, right? I don't want it to pull back. I want it to keep going up. But you're going to need to pull back to get on. So if it, I don't want it to go straight up is the point I'm trying to make. I can make a lot more money on a market that kind of gradually bumps its way higher with a few little knockouts along the way. Close the one to go straight up because because one to go straight up you you get in a few stocks or maybe two stocks you know it goes straight up you make you make okay money on those but then there's nothing else to to get into whereas if it kind of takes its time you go in you get a piece on one then you go in and you get a piece on another you get sector rotation it just works a lot lot better it also helps me beat the pants off buying whole <laughs> which is which is one of my goals. Energy is a bit of a bummer lately. They're losing steam. They've been doing pretty good, obviously. They made all-time highs recently, but I'd like to see them just bust out and not look back. Gold caught on fire today. Look at that. Look, look at that. Look at that breakout. That's huge. Okay, so gold went straight up. Silver also went straight up. 
this is a, a bow tie here for those keeping score. Okay, bow tie pullback entry probably like right there. So you know, how do you know the trend is in? I don't know. It turns up maybe with a bow tie. That that's one of the things you might want to look at. Metals and mining have been doing fantastic. Nice bottom in here. We're along C E N X, and I guess you could argue that A R L P is somewhat of a a mining company, being coal, right? It's lumped in with energy, lumped in. Listen to that. <laughs> As I've been saying, you got to burn a lot of coal to fire up all those electric cars. Take a look at drugs. Drugs have just really been amazing. Look at that. Straight up, fairly persistent, accelerating, higher, busting out to all-time highs. Now, we need a pullback, okay? So, you know, I hate for them to go straight up and then crash. We need a nice little early pullback, maybe a nice TKO move, scare some people out, shake some people out, get some shorts piling on. And then we start seeing some setups there. Biotech, not quite as impressive, but in general, working this way higher. Let's take a look at the semis. There's silver. Silver kind of looks like gold. Silver and gold. Semiconductors. One of the areas I love to watch. Longer term, still kind of in a downtrend. Short to the medium term, though, working this way higher. There's your bow tie. You know, go in and, and play with Landry Light and bow ties and all the other good stuff. And then just measure the net net price move, okay? From the lows, this thing has gone up, what, to let's say today's high, 36%. 36%. So that looks like a market that's trying to turn around, right? Now I know they're up, they're kind of choppy and longer term, still in a downtrend, but you kind of get the idea. All right, let's open it up. Uh, question The trade is determined by the US dollar, okay? Let's take a look at UUP. UUP is at the 200-day moving average, as is TLT. Oh, yeah, TLT. Yeah, TLT's been pretty impressive. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Is that a bow tie? Oh, look at that. Look at that. Okay, I didn't trade it, but there's your bow tie, okay? Your bow tie would have got you in a today's open. There you have it. Easiest pie, right? Well, where's... <laughs> okay, the trade is determined by the USD. UUP is at 200-day moving average. All right, let's add in a 200-day moving average. See what Craig is talking about. Craig, do you see that that uh, smart border collie? I forget the guy's uh, the dog's name, but it's, the dog knows like two thousand words, so to speak. He has the vocab. He has the. He doesn't actually talk. Although my dog, my dog talked the other day. My, my daughter showed up unexpectedly, and he said, "Hello." <laughs> anyway, uh, I thought about you. It's a border collie, smart as heck. Yeah, it's almost a two-day moving average. It's pretty straightforward. USC down long about everything. Yeah, the dollar down is that's probably what's pushing gold higher. It's so I almost said F word. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, these uh fear mongers on the radio, it's so it's so crazy. They're they're talking like why you should buy gold, and a lot of that reasoning is so flawed. But anyway, gold's going up now, so maybe I will buy gold. How's that? How about that? USD dollar is long about everything. Yeah, so the dollar, as the dollar drops, it's going to push commodities higher. And that's an intermarket technical analysis relationship that usually works. I'm a little disappointed in my Bitcoin, though. My Bitcoin is really not rallying like it should with the dollar weakening in here. And I'm also bummed out that Bitcoin is not a uh, flight to safety type of market. All right, let's take a look at a couple of, um, let's see, we'll take a look at CAAS. Yeah, this looks good. In fact, China, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed this one out. I'm doing a uh, presentation for China. They're going to probably fire me. <laughs> I need to get busy and finish it up. And uh, I've been looking for Chinese stocks to um, to add to it. Uh, volume's a little bit thin, but yeah, that's a nice little trend. I put that on your momentum list. There's nothing to do there, though, George, until it sets up, obviously. But yeah, oh, what a knockout! Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great candidate for a knockout. You got a base, a huge base. You got a nice breakout. See, here's your last TKO. Look at that. Although that's a little too crazy to probably actually trade, but this thing took off, and then here's your knockout move. It's it's um, a little exacerbated, but that's what a TKO looks like. So, yeah, if you get a move that looks like that over here, by all means. 
that'd be a great trade. A little on the thin side though, so check your spread before going in. Being foreign, that spread might be a little little wonky. All right, any more real quick? I know I'm a little bit over time, but Chaser's the dog. Yeah, Chaser's that, uh, that's really cool. Chaser, that's right. Pretty impressive. It's got me looking at my dog thinking, maybe she's smart. Yeah, nah. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of Aussie main lately. All right, while we're in the past, I want to thank everybody for watching and attending, I should say. Any unanswered questions, daviddavelandry.com, or let's just pick it up in Facebook for you guys that are in the Facebook group. If you want to join it, uh, you need to become a member of davelandry.com. You have to be a gold member to be in Facebook. And if you're a service member, you get gold for free, FYI. I'll throw some links in post, and there'll be some links in the description below. Everybody have a great weekend. If we don't talk again, and all you guys here that are in Facebook, I'll see you tomorrow. Well done, as usual, Dave. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome, Sam. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff, Paul, George, and the rest of you guys and girls. Thank you so much. Again, everybody have a great weekend, and I'll see most of you guys and girls tomorrow on Facebook. Thank you so much.